Hi, I'm Valerie Espinosa, and I'm your Public Regulation Commissioner in District 3. I have had this program for a good, almost, I think, maybe 10, 15 years, to be honest with you. So I wanted to uh, have a special day today to honor our veterans even though we're a little late, but we should honor our veterans every day. But uh, we've invited to be with us today is um, Ernest P. Garcia. And you are at the moment with all your uh, other accomplishments, but at the moment you happen to be the New Mexico VFW District 2 Commander. So I want to welcome you. And uh, this is going to be one of my best shows ever because I, I have a heartfelt um, amount of respect for you and all the veterans. My sister served uh, as a U-2 pilot in the Air Force. So mm -hmm. today's going to be all about you and, and uh, I'm honored that you're here. So thank you. We also have, um, your uh, your friend, your taxi driver here with you, uh, <laughs> Clarence Gallegos. Thank you for being here, and thank you for all you do with the veterans as well. And I'm fortunate to have met you. Otherwise, I would have never met Ernest and, and the many people that you have introduced me to. Um, thank you for allowing me to sponsor one of the veterans most recently on Veterans Day, and I'll be happy to continue uh, being by all of your sides. So thank, thank you. you. So let's start out with you. You've got a whole, and, and out of all due respect, I know you have medal after medal, but how did you earn the two bronze medals? We don't know what you go through. We're here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're on our homeland while you all are out there fighting for our country. And that's why I felt it would be important to bring you here today so you can tell us what you've been through. And you even wrote a book, and it's called Door Gunner. So um, I think that we want to hear all about it. And, okay. and I'm, I hope not to uh, get too uh, emotional here, okay? <laughs> so you have at it. Tell us about yourself. You've won this, um, earned this beautiful um, prestigious award knife yeah. for your service, and it's from the. Um, tell us about it. The door gunner. You were a door gunner, and yes. out of my ignorance, again, I had to ask you, and you told me what it was. But but you also said that your lifespan was a uh, twenty-minute expectancy. Is that right? Yes. Uh, well, I started off at my primary MOS, which is job description in the Army, was uh, avionics specialist, which was air, uh, aircraft radio repair. And uh, when I went to Vietnam, uh, I was in a cavalry unit. Uh, we had about 36 helicopters in my unit. And uh, it was my job to keep uh, the aircraft in pliable, worthy condition, you know, with communications and working on the radio system, transponders and everything, that electrical part that the pilots needed to operate and navigate the aircraft. So I worked on uh, Loaches, uh, Kiowas, uh, Hueys, Cobra gunships. And uh, I was down in the lower part uh, in what they call Three Corps in Vietnam, in a place called Xi'an. Spelled D I A N. And um, from there, uh, we started flying a lot of missions. I wasn't flying to begin with, I was too busy with my work. I was working 12 to 18 hours a day as an avionics specialist. And uh, uh, in due time, a lot of our helicopters started getting shot down. And uh, especially when uh, we went into Cambodia and the uh, Lam Sum 719 uh, uh, excursion. What year was that? Uh, 7071. Wow. And uh, in, in one month's time, to, to give you a better perspective and scope, we went through 35 helicopters that were either shot down or lost or damaged severely. And uh, of course, a lot of major casualties, the pilots, crew chiefs, and door gunners were getting killed. And uh, they just couldn't replace uh, all the aircraft and the uh, personnel fast enough, so they started asking for volunteer door gunners. Oh, I wonder how that worked. Do they train you, or they just no, say, "Hey, it was on the job training." You? JT. Oh, here. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, basically, what they had was uh, every time an aircraft gets sh shot down, uh, you have a, a, what is considered a scramble, and the scramble, uh, the sirens go off when uh, headquarters get uh, you know notice of mayday, mayday. Uh, plane going down or whatever, you know, with troops on it. So a, a siren goes off, and uh, anybody and his brother is carrying a weapon can run out the flight line and jump on a helicopter to go out there uh, to the uh, LZ uh, location uh, to try to 
extract the uh, the dead or wounded and salvage the helicopter if possible in the radio systems and whatnot. We didn't want the enemy to get a hold of our radio systems and frequencies and stuff like that. And that's what I dealt with also. So uh, I started uh, flying as a helicopter door gunner. Um, our life expectancy of a helicopter door gunner in actuality was about 20 minutes, uh, life expectancy of 20 minutes after takeoff on any given mission. That's amazing. And you knew that. You I knew, knew that. it. And you still volunteered. Yes. Because of the, uh, the rage that was building up in me for the loss of my close buddies, because I had become so close to the pilots, uh, oh. co pilot, uh, uh, crew chiefs, and door gunners. We became very close, and uh, I lost quite a few uh, buddies, and uh, I just started, started that drove getting this you. rage, you know, to go out there and um, volunteer, uh, you know, to fly these missions. And then when we pulled out of Cambodia, uh, they moved. Uh, when I was with the First Aviation Brigade, um, when we pulled out of Cambodia and back to Xi'an, then they immediately moved us up to to uh, Quantry, up in Icor. That's along the, the militarized zone, and we became part of the Ninth Infantry Division, Air Mobile. So we flew missions out of Quezon and uh, all that tri-border area. No man's land, what's called between uh, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, and Laos. Flew quite a few missions into Laos as well. Uh, we were very, very active, and I lost a lot of good friends. And I, I could tell you stories, but uh, just they're too heartbreaking sometimes. See, and that's a, that's about. the but thing. That's that in my book. That's the average, you know, person doesn't know what you go through. We can only assume what you what you've been through and then you know the sad part is you know you see it on CNN and then you see the bodies being brought back that's all we hear on this end right. so so uh, you know but when I, you had to go in and extract a body or bodies and put friends. them in put them in body bags yourself and load them on the helicopter and you you're sitting there on your, with a machine gun you know covering the uh, takeoff and you have these two or three bodies in body bags knowing that there were Americans and most of all they were your buddies and you're sitting there all the way back home to you know to base uh, to contend with just staring at those bodies knowing that they're dead you know and you help put up their mangled bodies or charred bodies in those body bags and, and, and you cannot help but wonder what their family is going to go through. And especially when they get the news. And yeah. So, but so, but you know, our job. Uh, we were in a scout unit. Uh, we weren't uh, search and rescue. Um, we were a scout units, and uh, what we did, we uh, flew tree top level. I mean, literally tree top level. When, I, especially when I was flying in the Kiowas as a door gunner, and uh, we tried to uh, find the enemy, attract fire mark the location with the uh, grenades, return fire, get out of the way, because right above us were the Hueys and the Cobra gunships ready to strike. And once we pulled out of the way, and then uh, that's the way we did, but uh, we were like guinea pigs, you know, flying treetop level, you know, literally, you know, and uh, trying to, uh, find the enemy and, and try I, to get fire. I right. think we could talk to you for hours on, about your your story. And and did you, um, when you wrote this book, it says here that you are a, um, it's, it's a memoir of Ernest P. Garcia, who grew up a poor but proud Hispanic in the border town of McAllen, Texas. So um, describe your journey. I mean, start from, from okay. when you were a child. Oh, and, then and that's basically what my book is based on, uh, the before, during, and after is the way I composed it, and uh, basically when uh, I can remember, and it's in my book also, going all the way back to elementary, where the first thing we did was go into the classroom, say the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, and you know, without fail, you know. I take that so, serious. So, you know, mm -hmm. as you grew up, you know, this was more and more instilled in you, you know, to love thy flag, thy country, you know, and uh, and everything, you know, it just followed me, you know. And, uh, and that thought process, you know, and 
I would do anything for my country and my flag, you know. So as um, as I was growing up, uh, coming from the barrio, you know, it wasn't an easy journey, but uh, I wound up uh, dropping out of high school because uh, just school wasn't my thing, and I went to work to help my family uh, support my siblings, you know, because it was just mom and seven kids. So uh, I went to work at a very early age. My grandfather and my uncle had a store, uh, and they pulled me in at a very young early age and to try to teach me a trade and keep me off the streets, so to speak, you know. So I, I worked uh, there and learned the meat cutting business. Hmm. Do you cut you know. meat now? Yes. <laughs> yes, I've got about 13 years experience as a journeyman meat cutter. I'll be. I've worked at Sam's Club and uh, What's the other one, uh, uh, the major one? Uh, 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 Walmart. Walmart. Yeah. You could uh, open your own business. And, uh, <laughs> they need uh, yeah. cutters for the elk season. So, but uh, it, it got, came down to the point where uh, I needed to start thinking about getting uh, finishing my education. Uh, so my mom got me into the Gary Job Corps Center hmm. in San Marcos, Texas. And I was going to be learning how to become a uh, uh, refrigeration uh, specialist, you know, uh, air conditioning refrigeration, you know, trade. But uh, I wasn't able to complete that uh, because of the riots back in the 60s. And the Job Corps, of course, consisted of minorities of all kinds, you know, Hispanics, uh, uh, African Americans and whites and Puerto Ricans, and uh, the, the the riots trickled into the J Gary Job Corps Center, and there was a lot of fights, a lot of stabbings, and everything was going helter skelter. I finally had to call mom and said, "Get me out of here," right. you know. So I still didn't get to complete that mission of that education. So. Um, I finally made the decision that uh, I needed to see about uh, joining the military and get uh, an education. So what I did was uh, I went to uh, the federal building and I, I walked into, I don't know why, but I walked into the Navy recruiter. Mm -hmm. and, you had a choice. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he said, yes, uh, may I help you? I said, well, I just wanted to see what the Navy had to offer. He, in a sarcastic mood, he said, no. It's what do you have to offer the Navy? Whoa. So I said, you know what? I'm in the wrong office. <laughs> Good for you. No. I turned around <laughs> I'm kidding. and went to the Army recruiter. And uh, we sat down and discussed. And he showed me different plans and everything. And uh, uh, I did not want to get drafted. I did not want to get drafted. I'd rather enlist and gar get a guarantee on a specialty that I could use in the future, uh, you know, fall back on. And um, <clears throat> so I wound up being uh, signing up as an avionics specialist. Okay, and uh, immediately I went in, and uh, I went within 11 months of service. I had already become a Spec Five, an E Five. Uh, you know, with uh, what the Army has to offer me. You know, as long as I did my part. You know. And, um, and my grades and everything were very high, and Look I feel all of them. So I wound up going through two major classes, uh, and uh, but the the latter class is called a skill development based program, where uh, if you in the first uh, training session, if your grades were high enough and if you got selected, uh, even though if you're an E1 or E2, whatever, and you and you got elected to the secondary school, which is the skill development based program you automatically got promoted to E4. Hmm. So you and, knew you were doing good. You yeah. knew exactly what this and was going to And then uh, upon completion of it, if you completed the course and everything, you, you automatically promoted to E5, Spec 5. And I did that. And uh, with the intentions of knowing that if you graduate from that and you get the promotion, you automatically go into Vietnam. Hmm. 